CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Jamie O, and welcome to the program. Our top stories. President Xi Jinping says China is ready to lead the way in a new closer community with Central Asian countries after a landmark summit in Beijing. Our other headlines. Ukraine's president calls on the Arab League not to turn a blind eye to Russia's actions in Ukraine, while Syria's president Assad is welcomed back into the fold. Starving Moscow's war machine, G7 leaders meet in Hiroshima to discuss new sanctions as they call for Russia's withdrawal from Ukraine. And counting the cost, Italy's flooding has caused billions of dollars of damage, with at least 13 people now killed. President Xi Jinping has called on China and Central Asia to fully unleash the potential for cooperation and forge stronger links. He's been setting out a grand development plan covering finance, infrastructure, trade, culture and security with a part of the world that is rich in natural resources and which has traditionally been closer to Russia. President Xi addressed the leaders of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan at a summit in Beijing. He said their gathering had added new impetus to the revitalization of those five countries and China. We should continue to set the pace for Belt and Road cooperation and deliver on the Global Development Initiative. We should fully unlock our potential in traditional areas of cooperation, such as economy, trade, industrial capacity, energy and transportation. And we should forge new drivers of growth in finance, agriculture, poverty reduction, green and low carbon development, medical services, health and digital innovation. We should work together to ensure that our community features win-win cooperation and common progress. Our correspondent Dai Kai is in Beijing. Dai Kai, talk of uh, closer ties in uh, all areas, but what about the detail on what's been announced? That's right, Jamie. The attending officials and entrepreneurs, uh, they all spoke highly of the summit. They think the summit creates a new platform uh, for, you know, the uh, cooperation between China and Central Asian countries. So in President Xi's speech today, he actually uh, made an eight-point proposal for strengthening cooperation, ranging from expanding economic ties to promoting cultural exchanges to safeguarding regional peace. So we learned that more trade facilitation measures will be rolled out and uh, bilateral investment treaties will be upgraded to push two-way trade and to a new heights. And the Chinese president also uh, mentioned that, you know, China is pledging to support the development of the, um, you know, the Trans-Caspian uh, International Transport Corridor and encourage capable enterprises to build overseas warehouses in Central Asian countries. So China will formulate a cooperation program for poverty and reduction as well through uh, science and technology and China's companies in Central Asian countries will be encouraged to create more local jobs. So uh, China will provide Central Asian countries with a total of 26 billion yuan or about 3.7 billion US dollars for uh, financing support and grants. So the uh, Central Asian leaders express their confidence and resolve to uh, strengthen cooperation with China and pursue common development. Jamie? Dai Kai, thank you for that. Our correspondent Dai Kai in Beijing. Do not turn a blind eye to Russia's actions in Ukraine. That was the message from Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, as he addressed the 22-member Arab League summit in the Saudi Arabian city of Jeddah. He thanked Saudi for its help in negotiating a prisoner exchange with Russia and call for the group to join him on his path to justice. Well, let's talk to uh, our correspondent, Yasser Hakim, who's uh, watching events in Jeddah. Yasser, this has been a truly extraordinary gathering of uh, the Arab League, uh, President Zelensky uh, and his uh, surprise address. 
Yes, it came as a surprise for everyone here. He landed uh, in host city Jeddah here just an hour before the summit began, and he went straight away to the uh, to the meetings, uh, to the to the meeting to the summit, and gave a keynote speech where he talked about uh, the the closeness between the Arab world and uh, uh, Ukraine. He brought. He said that he has with him. Uh, Muslim delegates from his country uh, attending with him uh, here uh, in the summit uh, and he, he, he sort of played on the sentimental part and how there is a lot of connections between the Arab world and Ukraine. He talked about how a lot of Arab students are were studying in, in Ukrainian universities. He talked about how there's a lot of uh, uh, cooperation economically, uh, the Ukrainian wheat uh, reaching a lot of Arab countries, very important strategic commodity uh, to Arab countries in the last years. He talked about uh, tourism and, and the cultural exchange between the countries. So he was trying to get, an, to, to get this type of uh, closeness between both sides so that he can call for, for support from the Arab world uh, to, to the Ukraine cause, you know, that uh, the Middle East region is still in touch and close ties with Russia. And he wanted to also get them on board the Ukrainian uh, cause. Uh, and this is how, uh, some of what he said in his speech. Ukrainians has never chosen the war. Our troops didn't go to other lands. We do not engage in annexations and plunder of other nations' resources, but we will never submit to any foreigners or colonizers. That's why we fight. Yes, and not only uh, Ukraine's leader in uh, the international spotlight, but uh, Syria's President Assad back in the uh, diplomatic fold too. Yes, it's been like 11 years since uh, he last showed up in the Arab summit. He was, uh, Syria was suspended from the Arab League, frozen its membership because of uh, the humanitarian, the human uh, rights abuses, uh, allegations against the Syrian leadership uh, throughout the years. And although many Arab countries, some Arab countries are still not normalized their ties with with uh, uh, Syria, but the Arab League has uh, unanimously uh, brought Syria back to the fold and its membership back to the fold. So uh, the, the Arab League chief even uh, just ahead of the summit said that not because Syria is back as a member of the Arab League, it means that all Arab states uh, should uh, uh, normalize its ties or resume ties with Syria. It is a sovereign decision. And this is an indication of some Arab states not really uh, behind this decision. But uh, uh, the, the whole aim of the summit this year is that uh, all countries, Arab countries, unite because of the growing number of conflicts and challenges uh, meeting the Arab world and especially uh, this impact on the economy of these countries, the economies of the Arab countries. And the Syrian president also gave a, a keynote speech here at the summit where he also called that for support for his country to be able to develop after years of, of war inside. And he said that he will try to also uh, uh, reach out to the Arab world and, and fulfill the conditions that have been set by the Arab countries to resume ties with Syria. We're talking about refugees, Syrian refugees to return to Syria. We're talking about uh, human rights uh, allegations and, uh, and conditions. We're also talking about uh, smuggling of arms and drugs that has uh, been coming out from Syria throughout the last few years and has caused a lot of uh, problems for uh, neighboring countries. So um, there is a lot of actions going on right now. The, the summit is still ongoing. It hasn't finished yet. There are speeches by Arab leaders still ongoing right now. And we'll be also uh, giving updates on the latest. Thank Yasser, you. thank you for that. Our correspondent Yasser Hakim in uh, Jeddah. G7 leaders have pledged to starve the Russian war machine as the group meets to discuss new sanctions against Moscow. A joint statement at the annual gathering of the world's wealthy democracies called on Russia's attack on Ukraine illegal, unjustifiable and unprovoked and called for the Kremlin to withdraw. Sanctions under discussion are said to be aimed at disrupting supply of military hardware and closing loopholes used to evade such measures. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky is due to join the group in person on Sunday.
The world is now facing multiple crises, such as the climate crisis, the pandemic, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Under these circumstances, the G7, which shares fundamental values, must effectively respond to important issues facing the international community and lead the world. Let's talk to the Associated Press correspondent Philip Crowther in Hiroshima. Um, Philip, good to see you. The UK has unveiled uh, new sanctions. What is the group as a whole going to be targeting? And realistically, how much agreement is there? Well, I think more than announcements from the G7 as a whole expect announcements and intentions of announcements of sanctions to trickle in over this weekend from G7 member countries and the likes of the European Union. Uh, so uh, you can not necessarily expect a larger statement from the G7, though last year in Germany uh, there were collective sanctions that were imposed by the G7 together this time around. That is unlikely to be the case. Essentially what the G7 here wants to do is to tighten punishment against Russia. It says in its statement so far, it also says that its support for Ukraine will not waver, that it will tighten that punishment on Russia's war machine, as the G7 says. Essentially, what these countries now want to do is impose sanctions, yes, new ones, but also make sure that old ones, current ones, are actually being imposed and also tighten loopholes. I'll give you two examples. Uh, the United States says that it will be imposing sanctions on Russian and third country entities that are involved in defense production. There's an acknowledgement there clearly uh, that Russia has been able and is able to evade some of those imposed sanctions. The European Union says that it wants to uh, restrict uh, the, the trade in Russian diamonds. An agreement on that, as is always the case with the European Union, is harder to get because all 20 seven member countries will have to give their okay and as you mentioned uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky he will have the opportunity to come here and essentially tell the G7 member countries whether he th thinks what they are announcing is good enough and uh, we heard um, President Zelensky address the uh, Arab League uh, just a few moments ago as you say he's due to uh, visit Hiroshima in person on Sunday what further support does he want what is he seeking Well, essentially, he's looking for more military aid, but more diplomatic help as well. When it comes to more military aid for Ukraine, you have heard this from the Ukrainian side for a long time now, and also during uh, President Zelensky's trip to Europe, uh, which has now ended with his trip to Saudi Arabia uh, and, and that summit. Uh, he wants essentially to get out of this G7 summit. He wants a pledge that fighter jets will be coming his way. That will be very, very hard to do. And that has been hard to do over the last few months for him as well. He will want the likes of Japan to provide lethal military aid. There is none right now from Japan. It is non-lethal aid right now uh, from that country. These are some of the things that Volodymyr Zelensky will want to achieve here. But there is also the diplomatic help, the uh, diplomatic solidarity that he is looking for because there are two countries here for example who have been invited to this G7 summit here in Hiroshima the likes of Brazil and India who are essentially holding a neutral role when it comes to uh, the war in Ukraine Zelensky can hope that there might be something like peer pressure here in Hiroshima that those countries see the G7 united uh, for Ukraine and against Russia and that they might uh, fall on Ukraine's side somewhat any which way it's going to be an extraordinary trip for Volodymyr Zelensky, the furthest he will ever have traveled outside of war-torn Ukraine. And he will see what you see over my shoulder here, the dome of the only remaining building from before the nuclear attack on the 6th of August 1945. You can see the skeleton thereof behind me, and he will be able to see that with his own eyes. The symbolism of the leader of a country at war seeing the worst that can happen when a country like Japan is at war will be particularly strong, especially considering that there have been those threats of the use of nuclear weapons by Russia against Ukraine. non proliferation the stop of production of nuclear weapons is very much one of the hallmarks, one of the main agenda items of the Japanese presidency of the G7 being held here in Hiroshima. Philip, thank you for that. Philip Crowther from the Associated Press in Hiroshima. You're watching CGTN Still Ahead. We meet the entrepreneurs making online deliveries easier 
in Brazil. talk about the difference Brazen accent. the difference is in the detail in the background defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story wherever the story may be cgtn see the difference This week on Razor, building biodiversity, the Scottish village that fundraised millions to create a nature reserve to restore wildlife, tackle climate change and support the community. What we want to do is show how communities can make a difference and how, and how when you come together with a common goal and a common vision, you can actually achieve something really amazing. Welcome back. A reminder of our top stories. President Xi Jinping says China is ready to lead the way in a new closer community with Central Asian countries after a landmark summit in Beijing. Our other headlines, Ukraine's President Zelensky calls on the Arab League not to turn a blind eye to Russia's actions in Ukraine, while Syria's President Assad is welcomed back into the fold. And G7 leaders meet in Hiroshima to discuss new sanctions against Moscow as they call for Russia's withdrawal from Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin has accused the West of trying to break up his country. Putin is also vowing that any new sanctions imposed by the West would only bring the Russian people closer together. At the G7 in Japan, leaders are discussing how to increase economic pressure on the Kremlin. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Stuart Smith, in Moscow. Um, Stuart, uh, what did uh, President Putin have to say altogether? Well, the gist of this was more reasoning, he says, for Russians to be considering the prospect of an existential threat should the so-called special military operation not continue or should it, uh, should it potentially uh, end up in a loss, something President Putin says is inconceivable. So he's calling on Russians to be unified and strong. And he says that Russian people know that the only way to make the country strong and, quote, indivisible, in, uh, quote, invincible, is through such unity. He was speaking at the Council of Inter-Ethnic Relations and that's also where he suggested, indeed, that the breakup of Russia is something that Western nations are trying to organize. He said the country is currently under uh, almost the entire arsenal of the West is directed at Russia, economic, military, political, informational, and suggested that powerful anti-Russian propaganda had been deployed. We've just had it confirmed that the Russian Prime Minister will travel to uh, China next week. Um, do you know any more about that from, uh, from Moscow? Yeah, so the Prime Minister's office here in Russia suggested that Mikhail Mishustin would be meeting uh, with the, his Chinese equivalent, uh, Xu Ang, and also Chinese leader Xi Jinping, although that hasn't been confirmed by the Chinese side. The point of this meeting is to follow up on the arrangements and deals done when President Xi Jinping was in Moscow earlier in the year, but also, according to Russian state media, to sign some new bilateral agreements relating to industry, energy, transport and infrastructure, as well as logistics. For Russia, China is really important because it's uh, the number one destination for its oil and also the second most important destination uh, for the coal uh, that Russia mines. It's also important with a host of Western sanctions as an alternative destination through which to import goods. So for Russia and China, both very eager to keep that relationship strong and also uh, keen to make sure that any future projects which have been planned for so long here in Russia relating to new fossil fuel development do go ahead. 
Stuart, thank you for that. Our correspondent Stuart Smith in Moscow. European and Chinese business leaders have been gathering in Ningbo in China, fostering links and trade deals between the two regions. Hungary is the featured country, the guest of honor. Hungary's ambassador to the UK has been talking about his hopes of boosting relations between China and Hungary, especially in tourism. We have excellent relations with China and, and even on the field of tourism before the pandemic, uh, we, we, we've, we've had wonderful cooperation. So I believe that when the, 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 the opportunities to travel are restoring again, as we see it now, many Chinese tourists will uh, go for Hungary. Of course, the pandemic spoiled everything, but now as we're returning to normality, uh, all these existing uh, connections should also return. Tsunami warnings in the South Pacific have been lifted after a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake near the French territory of New Caledonia. The quake was detected at a depth of 38 kilometers beneath the Pacific, prompting tsunami alerts for a string of islands. People on the island of Vanuatu had early been advised to move from coastal areas to higher ground. Five TikTok users from the United States state of Montana have filed legal action in a federal court seeking to block a ban of the social media app. On Wednesday, the governor signed legislation which will come into effect in January, making it illegal in the state to download the Chinese-owned platform. The users believe the law violates their First Amendment rights. A 95-year-old grandmother is critically ill in hospital after being tasered by Australian police at a care home. The police say they were called to the care home about 300 kilometres southwest of Sydney after staff found one of the residents outside her room holding a steak knife. One fired a taser after failing to persuade the woman who has dementia to drop the knife. People in northeastern Italy are sifting through their damaged homes after flooding killed at least 13 people. Huge swathes of farmland are underwater and weather forecasters warn there is more bad weather heading that way. Our correspondent Giles Gibson reports. The heart of a small community now underwater. The cleanup is beginning in towns and villages like Castel Bolognese, and residents are trying to come to terms with what happened. We couldn't imagine something this big. We have found ourselves with more than one metre of water in front of the house. Here, there is the sign of the level the water reached. We were stranded on the second floor and waited for this to be over. A lot of things went wrong, but it could have been worse. An hour's drive away in the town of Cesena, the devastation is also sinking in for Raffaella Zani. My married life is over here, she says, pointing to a rubbish bin as her husband looks on. The water damaged their wedding album beyond repair. All the memories finished, she says, through her tears. On top of precious memories and the lives lost, this crisis represents yet another blow to Emilia Romagna's agricultural sector. Italy's National Farmers Union, Coldiretti, estimates 5,000 farms are now underwater across the region. Farmers here have faced drought last summer, a winter with very little rain, and now these devastating floods. Dio. Ma. Local authorities also say there's still a risk of more landslides with hundreds already reported. Here in Rome the Italian government has pledged 20 million euros of assistance and that's on top of 10 million that was allocated for previous flooding. The Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni will also host a crisis meeting on Tuesday next week when she returns from the G7 summit in Japan. Giles Gibson for CGTN in Rome. Shopping online and getting it delivered in Brazil's favelas is very difficult. Lack of security and registered addresses make them off limits for most e-commerce. But entrepreneurs there are trying to change all that. Our correspondent Lucretia Franco reports. 
Vila Ideal, a favela em Rio de Janeiro, is just one of the over 11,000 informal neighborhoods spread throughout Brazil. A maze of cinder block homes where drugs and violence are common. Delivery services here are off limits. Not for the Delivery das Favelas, a startup that connects retailers and customers through a website and takes care of all the logistics. I already lived in two favelas and I know what it feels like to buy a product online, paying the delivery fee and not receiving it because of where I lived. So far, the company is operating in Vila Ideal and in two other communities, setting up distribution centers where purchases are brought and sorted for further delivery. But it's not easy to find addresses here. Many homes are located in streets or alleys, like this one, without names or numbers. So the company only hires favela residents who know the area well to make the deliveries. Whether on motorbikes or by foot, if needed, the parcels are delivered to the buyer's homes, no matter in which part of the community they live. Retailers finance the whole operation with no cost for the clients. I have been living here for 40 years, and this is the first time I'm receiving a product at my doorstep. I am very happy. And the company is expected to grow. The number of Brazilians living in favelas has jumped 40% since the 2010 census, from more than 11.4 million to nearly 16 million people in 2022. We are seeing this increase of people forced to live in favelas and needing to be treated equally and with dignity. Favela residents say the initiative is allowing them to access affordable online shopping, something they need and deserve, just like everyone else. Lucrecia Franco, CGTN, Rio de Janeiro. The headlines again. President Xi Jinping says China is ready to lead the way in a new closer community with Central Asian countries after a landmark summit in Beijing. Our other headlines, Ukraine's President Zelensky calls on the Arab League not to turn a blind eye to Russia's actions in Ukraine, while Syria's President Assad is welcomed back into the fold. And G7 leaders meet in Hiroshima to discuss new sanctions against Moscow as they call for Russia's withdrawal from Ukraine. And that is The World Today. Thank you for watching. There's more news on CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app or scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. We're back with more news at the top of this hour. Coming up next, it's World Inside. For now, from all of the team in London, it's goodbye.